Welcome to episode 44 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. The trouble with tribbles. In this week's episode, there's more trouble with the Klingons, as the Enterprise responds to a grain-related distress call. As tensions build on either side of an uneasy truce, a new alien species begins to cause problems on board the ship. With sabotage suspected, can Kirk figure out the true culprit in time? Or will his rival strike a blow for the Empire? Where I come from, that soda pop. Well, this is a drink for a man. Scotch? Aye. It was invented by a little old lady from Leningrad. Good afternoon, Ian. How are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you today? Full of scotch, as usual. Gets you through the day. There's nothing else I can be. <laughs> How are things? Not too bad at all. You enjoy this one? I did. It was quite a lightweight episode, I thought, but I can imagine it's a very popular one. It's considered a classic. See, that's interesting. I could go either way, I think. It's so light and airy and, and fun that a lot of the, maybe the hardcore fans might not enjoy it as much they'll enjoy it do they i think you can contrast it with some of the other light-hearted ones that are just silly mm. i think shore leave was silly for example mm-hmm. whereas this one there's a you've still got the heart of the show in there sure you mentioned i think last week that there were klingons in this week's episode i expected more yeah well they're they're a driver they're the disguised klingon i suppose more so than the mm-hmm. visible ones although one of the visible ones was quite familiar looking he was I noticed him straight away. I didn't. Did you not? No. <laughs> I knew he was in it and I didn't even really think about it when I was okay. watching it. Yeah, we'll get there. Of course, this is the character I remember him as most, which is probably why. Really? Yeah. He, he comes back and Duke Space Nine plays the same character again. Okay. He wasn't in it that much this week. His previous incarnation, he was front and centre. That's true. But there's a bit of a mythos built up around the character. Right. Shall we get into this? Let's crack on. <laughs> We begin in the briefing room. Yeah, where are they on their way to? They're on, well, I don't think they're on their way anywhere. They're patrolling near Klingon space. They talk about K7 space station, but I don't think that's their destination at this point. Okay, I, I thought that's where they were going, but anyway. No, they, I think they just talk about it and then Chekhov makes a joke about how close they get to Klingon space that Spock decides, I think for his own amusement, to pull him up on. Mm. Yeah, they're testing Chekhov on his knowledge. Yeah, he's being a bit immature. Why? He talks about being close enough to cling on space to smell them. And Spock says it's a very poor joke. Or a very small joke, I think he says. Yeah, he doesn't appreciate the quip. Kirk then turns his attention to Spock and asks for a history of the quadrant. What's he told? He tells me about the disputed area. Uh, we, we looked at this a wee bit back when we had the first episode of the Klingons. There's a dispute over certain planets. The Organians came in to, and there. And we get a mention here of the Organian Peace Treaty in a couple of minutes, which is a reference back to that episode. Spock tells Kirk about another planet, Sherman's Planet, which is an unusual name for a planet. Yeah, I must admit, it annoyed me, the use of it through the episode, Sherman's Planet. Especially when they name the person who first discovered it and he's not called Sherman. <laughs> Anyhow, Spock reckons the Federation has the stronger claim to this planet, though he's maybe biased. Possibly, yeah. Chekhov claims that uh, a Russian was the first to map the area, but is quickly corrected on this by both Kirk and Spock. They both know it was a Brit called John Burke. Now, I think this might be a little bit unfair on Chekhov. It's almost as if there is... I've noted it a few times now, where they use Chekhov's claims that everything was invented. And we heard a bit in, in the clip at the top of the show where they, they mock him claiming that everything comes from, from Russia, was invented or originated there. And I get the feeling that this is a little bit of reverse propaganda that the show has. It's like they're laughing at him claiming everything comes from Russia, but I'm not always convinced that it's, they're not playing the same trick in themselves. Yeah, to a certain extent. I wonder if also they're mocking the Russian national identity, the feeling that they have, that Russia believes it is the centre of the, the world at that time in history. That's what I'm saying, but I think there's maybe a, a slight arrogance there. 
on behalf of the the Americans in this case, the the the, the British, possibly. Maybe that they've just been convinced by propaganda. Maybe it was. Yeah, maybe. It's, it's possible. There's certainly various historical events that are attributed to multiple people depending on mm. where you observe them from. Anyway. Yes, this is where Chekhov references the Organians and the Organian Peace Treaty that was the conclusion to Errand of Mercy back in Season 1. Ah, yes. And apparently one side or the other must prove it can develop the planet most efficiently. Yeah. Kirk states that the Klingons, whilst brutal, are efficient. Better farmers, essentially. So they win. That's the end of it then. But they don't have possession of the planet. Mm. We get first shot in the Federation. Chekhov then starts to talk about a similar problem that Peter the Great once had, but is interrupted by Ahura on comms. Yes, there's been a distress call from the nearby K7 Deep Space Station, and Kirk orders the Warp 6 pursuit of that target. And a red alert is called. We then have the credits followed by Captain's Log 4523.3. Yeah, he's, he's egging it up. You can tell he's made this log after the event. He says that this priority one call signals near or total disaster. They assume the Klingons have attacked the station and they're going in ready for a fight. Up on the bridge, phasers are armed whilst on the screen we see the station in front of them. Yes, but they're confused. It's peaceful. So what I thought was, maybe your assumption is wrong. They just assumed it must be under attack from the Klingons. They get there and it's okay, maybe it's not. Maybe there's some other yeah, disaster befalling problem, yeah. So the station commander is hailed and he apologises for having put out this distress call and invites Kirk over to get the explanation. Yeah, Kirk is he's very annoyed at this. He thinks it's a, a misuse of the uh, the distress communication. Yeah, he's possibly also annoyed he didn't get to fight some Klingons. <laughs> yeah. He takes Spock with him and they go to visit this station commander. I think his name is Lurie. Yeah, when they beam down, he immediately demands to know what is going on from Lurie and his two guests and why he ordered the distress call. Oh, that was my order, Captain. Captain Kirk. This is Niels Barris. He's out from Earth to take charge of the development project for Sherman's planet. And that gives you the authority to put an entire quadrant on defense alert? Mr. Barris is the Federation Undersecretary in charge of agricultural affairs in this quadrant. And that gives him the authority. Hmm. This is my assistant, Arn Darvin. And this is my first officer, Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock? And now, Captain, I want all available security guards. I want them posted around the storage compartments. Storage compartments, storage compartments. The storage compartments containing the Quadro The what? What? What's Quadro Triticale? Wheat. So what? The Quadro Triticale is not wheat, Captain. Of course, I wouldn't expect you or uh, Mr. Spock to know about such things, but uh, Quadro Triticale is a rather. Quadro Triticale is a high yield grain four-lobed hybrid of wheat and rye, a perennial also, if I'm not mistaken. Its root grain, triticale, can trace its ancestry all the way back to 20th century Canada. Uh, Mr. Spock, you've made your point. Quadro triticale is the only earth grain that will grow on Sherman's planet. Now, we have several tons of it here on the station, and it's very important that that grain get to Sherman's planet safely. Mr. Barris thinks that Klingon agents may try to sabotage it. You issued a priority one distress call for a couple of tons of wheat. Quadro triticale. That was a very strange delivery by Kirk. Not just the fact that he repeated things twice for no apparent reason, but his attitude and I don't know, there was something odd about his performance. Yeah, so that's either in the script or the director asked for it or William Shatner has just decided to repeat lines, which he doesn't do in any other episode. No. It's a bit of an odd one. I wonder if it's an editing issue. You think? It's possible because they didn't have perfect setups back in the day. I don't think so. You don't think it is? No. Mm. Maybe Shatner was just trying out a, a new way of doing things. Maybe, it didn't work. Maybe he didn't understand the way it was written and he's just said it the same way twice and it should have been yeah. pre like presented differently. I don't know. It certainly stands out. Yeah, it's noticeable. Mm. And we, we all heard it there. Kirk is not happy with what we heard there and claims Seriously unhappy. very unhappy yeah he claims that the enterprise was summoned under false pretenses and barris 
will have to take responsibility for that. Yes, apparently misuse of the Priority One channel is a Federation offence, but Barris is adamant that his usage was legitimate. Yeah, and so Laurie tries to moderate and asks if Kirk won't at least post some guards, a request which Spock thinks is quite logical. Given the extreme importance of Sherman's planet to the Federation. So what does Kirk agree to do? Oh, takes them literally and beams down a couple of guards. Yeah. Literally two guards are beamed down and deployed to guard the wheat. Barris is outraged at this. However, Kirk is not for listening and claims not to have questioned the order or intelligence of the Federation until now. This is the only representative he's ever questioned. He storms out. We should mention actually shortly before that he authorised shore leave for everyone else on the Enterprise who wasn't working. Correct. And this is another example, I think, that Kirk just acts out of character. Well, he thinks this is below him. But and it's below the Enterprise. Yeah. But down in the bar of K7. Yeah, he's that mad, he's gone for a drink. Yeah, over Spock. a drink, he, he continues to moan about the distress call, but Spock reminds him that the Klingons would not be happy about watching the Federation develop Sherman's planet. That'll cheer him up. They go to leave. Who do they meet? Chekhov and Uhura coming in. And as they do, Kirk is perturbed to find that he appears to be the only one who isn't aware of this this wheat. Yes, he's also a bit sarcastic about them taking their shore leave that he authorised. Yeah. And Uhura points out that last time everyone had shore leave, she didn't get to leave the ship. True. <laughs> Chekhov, he's able to immediately identify the, the stuff as, for what it is. And again, he claims it's a, a Russian invention. And I think that's, a, uh, yeah, just to reiterate, I think that's a, a continual piece of propaganda that the show puts out. It's overdone, in it my is. opinion, especially in this episode. While they're having this conversation, a large man, who we later learn is Cyrano Jones, enters the bar. He offers an uninterested barman some Antarian glow water. You get the impression that this barman has purchased from Mr. Jones previously and not been satisfied. Yeah. He's a, a Del Boy type. A Harry Mudd type. Indeed. Ahura, however, is taken with his next offering. Yes, it's a little ball of fur that makes pigeon noises. Yeah, known as a tribble or, a, as I noted, a gremlin. Potentially. Mm. As long as you don't feed it, it will be fine. They won't, surely they won't feed it. Well, you wouldn't think so. Uhura is almost seduced by the positive reaction she gets from the tribble. It kind of coos at her. Yeah, I can understand why some people might find it charming and cuddly and cute. She tries to cut in on the negotiation with the barman who instead closes the deal with Jones, who then undermines him by giving Uhura the sample for free. Yeah, well, he rightly says that she will be a, a great marketing asset. No doubt. We're back on the Enterprise, I think the briefing room, is that right? Well, before that, uh, Chekhov makes a note that the trouble that they've got there is eating the sample of grain that he's holding. That's true, yes. Well worth noting. Mm. Up in the briefing room. Spock and Kirk get a visual communication from Admiral Fitzpatrick from Starfleet Command. They do. Kirk is reminded of the importance of Sherman's planet and is ordered to protect the grain. Yeah, this is a bit of a, an arse kicking for Kirk. Yeah, it goes against the grain for him. Hmm. Uhura, at this point, urgently advises that they are being approached rapidly by a Klingon cruiser. So a red alert is called and they head to the bridge where they find Chekhov, who tells them that this battleship is sitting 100 kilometres away and then Lurie is put on visuals so that Kirk can inform him. Yes. He advises, however, that the Klingons pose no threat. Why not? Two of them are standing right beside him, including the captain of the Klingon vessel. Ah, okay. So the red alert is cancelled and Kirk and Spock beam back down. We then have a, a captain's log, 4524.2. I think this is just a... Recap. Recap. Nothing new. It just says their intentions are unknown. And in Lurie's office there are false smiles all around as Kirk and Spock are greeted by a Klingon who looks familiar. He does. A Captain uh, Koloth. Indeed. I immediately spotted him as Trelane from... The Squire of Gothos. Indeed, the yeah. eponymous hero. Well, I'm Anti-hero, hmm. maybe. Irritant. Villain. Yeah. He assures Kirk that his intentions are peaceful and he just wants to invoke his right to shore leave on the station. Yeah, and the uh, Organian Peace Treaty means that they cannot be refused this. Indeed, there's that treaty again. Yeah. Lurie then takes him aside 
He, he, he explains that he doesn't like it, but he has to go along with it. So, Kirk turns and informs them that they can bring down up to 12 of their men, but that he will match the number in security personnel. Cloth kind of bristles at this, and they both agree that they'll try and keep things peaceful. Yeah, I think he is quite rightly annoyed. There's no uh, declaration of war, he states, at this moment in time. They should that be able comes to... up every time we see the Klingons, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you're not at war with us, why do you keep treating us like we're your enemy? I've got a point. Yeah? Anyway, he departs. Yes. Up on the Enterprise, in the rec room, we see Scotty relaxing, reading a technical manual, which Kirk mocks him for. Does he? Yeah. What did he say? He just takes the mickey out of him for reading a technical manual as relaxation. Okay. Uhura's Tribble has drawn a crowd, both of uh, crewmen and of other Tribbles. Yeah, they have bred considerably overnight. These are definitely gremlins. It could be. McCoy's certainly curious, and Kirk has a couple of questions. I'm sure he does. Now, I think this is a, at the point where we should discuss Ahura's responsibility in this entire mess. This is ridiculous. You can't go to a foreign planet, pick up some sort of creature and take it back. There must be rules and policies in place. You cannot go to another country, and just now on Earth. Well, yeah. certainly just now, you can't even do it with a person. But if you take a dog somewhere, you have to quarantine because you don't know what it's going to bring in. Surely in space, they must have learned a lesson. You can't pick up a creature you know nothing about and take it back to a, a, a confined space. I like to think that everything gets scanned when it's being transported. It does, it, yeah, well, obviously it doesn't. And even if it does get scanned, it doesn't make any difference because they, uh, they haven't been able to pick this up. Yeah. You cannot bring in strange creatures or who That's a, a nonsense. And Kirk as well has to take, and McCoy have to take responsibility for this. Why did they not immediately uh, send them back or get them uh, transported off the ship? Like? Or at least uh, taken to a lab and monitored. Yeah. But McCoy, I, mean, I, I, heard, I don't know what she's thinking. In a bar, picking up, uh, buying a, a, a random creature from a, a guy in a bar. You, yeah. think that's, you think that's best practice? You think that's professional? Idiot. Questionable behaviour. Well, she almost brought down the entire... Ship. But we maybe get an explanation from Spock here who notes that this creature has a tranquilizing effect on humans. So does uh, lots of different types of drugs. Doesn't mean you say you can, you know, that's a, you can yeah. use them. That might lead to the poor decision making that people have demonstrated and we also see it having the same effect on Spock himself. Yeah, it might do, but that's not the point, is it? It's like, so does um, drinking alcohol, but you can't use that. Oh, I'm sorry, I know I made that really bad decision, but I was drunk. <laughs> oh yeah, well, well, that's okay then. Yeah, but you would know that the alcohol was going to make you drunk, whereas you didn't know that this creature was going to affect your decision making. Yeah. Anyhow, Spock and Kirk leave, and McCoy borrows a tribble from Uhura to examine in his lab, promising not to harm it. Yeah, she doesn't seem that bothered, as long as she doesn't know about it. Yeah, and then an ensign, I think, Freeman? Uh, gets uh, one of the children or child tribbles for free. And then they all pile in and, and, and grab one. Yeah. Out in the corridor, Kirk takes communication from an angry Barris complaining about the Klingons on K7. But Atechi Kirk points out that the guards are there at the request of Starfleet before he heads down to Sickbay. He's got a sword. Right. He has. McCoy gives him something for this. Yes, and Kirk notes that the tribble that Bones took is now many tribbles. Yeah, I think he has a eleven of them. Although he hasn't yet worked out how they do it. No. <laughs> McCoy thinks that... Sorry, sorry, that just reminds me of uh, Fletch Lives. And speaking of Fletch Lives, today Hal Holbrook died. You've just dated our podcast. It doesn't matter. Okay. Fletch lives, yeah. There, uh, there's a scene where Fletch dresses up as a uh, a bug inspector to get into a place, and he lifts up a pretend invisible little mite and puts it to the the guard's ear and tells him that they breed by masturbation. Then it accidentally drops into his ear. <laughs> so anyway, if you like Fletch, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm sure some someone does out there. Lots of people do. Fletch lives classic, not quite as good as the first, but still up there. Okay. McCoy notes half the Tribble's metabolism is set up for reproduction and Kirk can only recommend that he opens a maternity ward. Huh. At the transporter room, another group is getting ready to beam down for shore leave but Scotty doesn't intend to go until Kirk orders him to, to make sure that he keeps the rest in line. This annoyed me. Kirk's behaviour or Scotty's? Uh, Kirk's. But is he being unreasonable to Scotty? Yeah. 
I think you can't expect him to go. Demand that he takes his, his shore leave, but that he's to uh, work at the same time. So you've got to get down there, take your holidays, but you're responsible for the, the rest of them. So am I working or not? Are you sending me down there in a, an official capacity? You know, can I get in there and, and get drunk and, and relax? It's not surely then. Yeah, it's more like, yeah, you can go down and relax, but I trust you to be the responsible one. No, but you're, you're not. At that point, I'm off duty. I'm not being responsible. I might get, I might be really irresponsible and get blind drunk and uh, pass out for a few days. So yeah. I'm not, do you want me to be responsible for nope. them or not? You pay me to, nope. to work. You're not getting paid, but you're on duty. Yeah, I didn't like that. Also, his reluctance to go down himself. I'm thinking, is it because he realises he's a bit of a menace? Scotty? Yeah. Yeah, you might get drunk and murder a woman. Yeah, or at least be inappropriate with her. Yeah, if there's any women there. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. We don't, but he, at least he, I think he might realise that he's put himself in a position where he shouldn't be. So he's saying, nah, I'll, I'll just stay. After the last few times, I'm... Kirk's like, ah, go on, you got away with it the last time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back down in the, uh, the K7 bar. It's very busy and Scotty turns down the chance to buy yet another triple. Yeah, Sh Scotty is there with Chekhov in a random yellow shirt. They sit down at a table. Jones then has the same result with the barman who produces his now expanded collection of creatures. He doesn't need to buy anymore because he's, they're self-replicating. Yeah, the crew get their drinks and Chekhov is not convinced with Scotty's choice. That's what we heard at the top of the, yes. the podcast. And we see a, a drunk Klingon. Yeah, is this where he approaches Jones and we get the reaction from the triple? Yes. Or is this, no, I think this is when Jones first went in. Okay. Jones approached him at his, at his table, but now the, the Klingon goes to the bar himself. He's clearly worse for wear and looking for a fight. Yes, but he's also not happy with the tribbles. Why not? They keep shouting at them. Yeah. Every time a tribble goes near a Klingon, it yells. That might be quite useful then. I don't know if they use it in the future. I'm assuming not. But if you could keep one triple and just use, it, use that as a Klingon detector. Yeah, yeah. Train them up. They should think of that by the end of this episode. Hmm. Anyhow. He, yeah, he starts mouthing off, doesn't he? Korax, I believe his name is, he complains about Earthers mm -hmm. to Jones. And Chekhov gets upset. Scotty orders him not to get involved. So he calms down a little. Yeah, he claims that these earthers remind him of uh, regular bloodworms, and he, he goes on to specifically insult Kirk. And as you say, Chekhov is is up for um, having a bit of a fight about this. But Scotty thinks, listen, it's only insults. Calm it. We're big enough. We're we're sensible enough to to ignore this. His tune changes, however, when Korax turns his vitriol from Kirk to the Enterprise. Easy, lad. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. That's right. And if I think that Kirk is a Denebian slime devil, well, that's my opinion too. Don't do it, mister, and that's an order. But you heard what he called the captain. Forget it. It's not worth fighting for. We're big enough to take a few insults. Now drink your drink. Of course, I'd say that Captain Kirk deserves his ship. We like the Enterprise. We, we really do. <laughs> that sagging old rust bucket is designed like a garbage scow. Half the quadrant knows it. That's why they're learning to speak Klingonese. <laughs> Mr. Scott. Laddie. Don't you think you should rephrase that? You're right. I should. I didn't mean to say that the Enterprise should be hauling garbage. I meant to say that it should be hauled away as garbage. <laughs> what follows next is a good old-fashioned barroom brawl. Yes, and Jones taking advantage of said brawl to pour himself drinks from behind the bar. Yeah, after the barman runs off. The extended scene ends when a, a squad of Enterprise security arrive. And then we have a captain's log, 45, 25.6. Yes, he talks about a small disturbance between the Klingon crew and Enterprise crewmen. And 
shore leave has been cancelled for both ships as a result. Now, explain to me why, how Kirk has the authority to cancel shore leave for Klingons. It must be in the treaty. You think? I guess so. So it can't just be Kirk because he's not always there, so it's any... Oh, I'm not sure. He'll be the ranking officer because I don't think that the other guys are Starfleet. So right. maybe that's just how it works when this hmm. sort of situation arises. Okay. In the briefing room, Kirk is not happy. No, he's got all these men who are in the fight lined up, including Chekhov, who's got a, a bit of a bashed face. He is demanding to know who started the fight. However, none of them are for talking. So, he dismisses them and confines them to quarters until he finds out who threw the first punch. He holds Scotty back, though, and reminds him that he was meant to be there to stop trouble. Again, so I would have said, I was on shore leave. What's the situation? Am I, am I getting paid for that? Well, probably not now. You're you still do. representing the company. Ah, okay. Anyway. anyway, Scotty does admit at this point that it was he who threw the first punch. And Kirk is ultimately a bit disappointed by the circumstances. Yeah, because he talks about uh, Kirk being insulted and he thinks that that must have been the reason. Yeah, but it wasn't, obviously. And he finds out why, yeah. So a slightly disappointed Kirk dismisses him, but reminds him that he is restricted to quarters. A fact that delights him. Yes, because there's got plenty more tech journals to be catching up on. <laughs> I think we're at the, the lab in sick bay now. Yes, Spock is, I think, disquieted by these troubles. Yeah, they've continued to multiply. He starts quoting Shakespeare. Does he? He talks about considering the lilies of the field. Ah. Oh, no, it's not Shakespeare, it's the Bible. Right, okay. Um, they neither, whatever, weave nor sow, but they consume, essentially. Okay. So these, I think I've made parts of that up. But anyway, it is a Bible quote <laughs> he uses. And they, he's talking about how the Tribbles don't contribute anything, but they consume and they take up space as well as resources. Yeah, McCoy seems to like them, even though they seem to serve no particular purpose. Yeah, and he points out to Spock that it is a, a human characteristic to love cute little creatures. He also tells Spock that he likes the Tribbles better than he likes Spock, which prompts Spock to retaliate with the one redeeming feature of the Tribbles being that they don't talk much. <laughs> Up on the bridge, Kirk enters and gets worried after almost sitting on one of these little things and then realising that they are everywhere. Literally everywhere. He summons McCoy to the bridge and asks Ahura what's going on. Yeah, she should be sacked or she, put in some sort of suspension for this. She doesn't seem to feel bad about it at all. She hasn't apologised. Any responsibility. Well, yeah, not only does she not feel bad or apologetic about what she's done, she can't offer any explanation as to what's happening. But McCoy reveals what little progress he has made on his arrival. Dr. McCoy. Yes. Do you want to see me, Jeff? Well, don't look at me. It's the Tribbles who are breeding. And if we don't get them off the ship, we're going to be hip deep in them. Can you explain that? Well, the nearest thing I can figure out is that they're born pregnant. Which seems to be quite a time saver. I know, but really... And from my observations... It seems they're bisexual, reproducing at will. Now, brother, they got a lot of will. Captain, I'm forced to agree with the doctor. I've been running computations on their rate of reproduction. The figures are taking an alarming direction. They're consuming our supplies and returning nothing. Oh, but they do give us something, Mr. Spock. They give us love. Well, Cyrano Jones says that a triple is the only love that money can buy. Too much of anything, Lieutenant. Even love isn't necessarily a good thing. Yes, Captain. Maintenance crew will clean up the entire ship. And then contact Mr. Lurie and tell him I'm beaming down. Aye, aye, sir. Have him find Cyrano Jones and hold him. Aye. And get these tribbles off the bridge. Aye, aye, Captain. I'm assuming McCoy wasn't using the modern meaning of bisexual. No, I think he means that the Tribbles either are both sexes at the same time or can be either sex at different times. Sure. Down in Lurie's office, Jones is trying to plead his innocence and claims not to have known the consequences of taking the Tribbles from their natural habitat. Yes, he points out that breeding animals is not against regulations when they're not dangerous. And it's his only way of making money. He decides to leave and as he tries to do so we see Barris and Darwin arrive. Yeah, who proceeds to 
Slate Kirk for the perceived lack of security. He believes that Cyrano Jones is a Klingon agent. Yeah, I think Kirk's a bit shocked by this. He's no no grounds for suspecting this. None at all, but apparently Darwin has been watching Jones and has reported that he is suspicious and he thinks he was involved in instigating the bar fight. Mm. Additionally, his ship's log suggests that he was nearby the Klingons four months ago. Yes, Barris believes he may be or may have been recruited as a Klingon spy. However, Spock informs them that they have checked his background and that he has never broken any law and has earned a meagre living buying and selling for the past seven years, including the triples. Barris thinks he's after the grain and Darwin says he's disrupted the whole station. Yeah, but rightly Kirk says this doesn't prove he's a spy. It's also not an offence. So you get a sarcastic au revoir from Kirk and he scoots off. He's got no time for them. He's got no respect for he's them. not happy to be here at all. This sort of overbearing banality of the whole circumstance mm. is just weighing on him. The Enterprise uh, rec room, I think we are now. You can't really tell because it's overflowing with dribbles. Yeah, even on Kirk's chicken sandwich and coffee. Ah. Ah. Which is too much for him and he demands that they are removed from the ship. Scotty arrives with an arm full of his own and reports that they are in everything. Yes, including the machinery and they probably entered from the air vents. This is an immediate concern to Spock who notes that K7 has similar air vents and, as Kirk notes, has them in the storage vaults. Ah. So realising the severity of the situation, Kirk prepares to beam down and meet Barris and Laurie beside the grain. First of all, he has to negotiate his way past the tribbles that are all over the transporter pads. And when they finally arrive, Kirk tells a guard to open up the storage hatch, which they find is stuck. Yes, Kirk manages to, however, to open one of the overhead doors. And when he is successful, he wishes he wasn't. Yes, he's overwhelmed as about a million tribbles come pouring out of this. Up to his neck. Yes. Spock also notes that these tribbles are gorged and there's no sign of any grain. Yeah, it's a situation that Barris says he's going to hold Kirk responsible for. Without any real basis. No. They ponder how many there are and Spock notes that they're over 1.7 million. 1,771,561. Apparently the maths holds up if you go with what Spock says here, I'm told. I'm sure there's lots of nerds that have done it. <laughs> McCoy enters and proclaims that he knows how to stop them breeding. Yes, don't feed them and Dremel. don't get them wet after midnight. <laughs> Which they are a little late for. Kirk wishes that he'd known this before. Yeah, however, they won't have to deal with the entire 1.7 million. No, McCoy and Spock begin to note that a number of the Tribbles have died and Spock suggests there might have been something in the grain. So he tells McCoy to take a Tribble and some of the grain to his lab to find out what is going on. Yeah, he goes off to do that and Barris remains infuriated. Yeah, he again has a go at Kirk and tells him that he's going to be reported and he will take great pleasure and whatever punishment he receives. Kirk points out that until then, he's still the captain. So he asks for Cyrano Jones to be found and the door above his head that's still dropping tribbles on him to be closed. <laughs> we find ourselves in Lurie's office. Harassed, Jones is manhandled into a chair, followed by Cola, who demands an apology from Kirk for the way he supposedly treated the Klingon people. He does, and Barris thinks this could lead to the Klingons gaining Sherman's planet. Mm. Although Spock thinks that's very unlikely. Yeah, he's more relaxed and claims that the, wor the word of a, an angry Klingon commander would not be enough to achieve such a thing. Koloth is of the view that events are already in motion that will lead to the planet being conceded. Yeah, but this is an assumption that Kirk does not support. Not at all. Koloth has one request before they continue their discussion. What's that? He wants all the tribbles to be removed from the room because they don't get on with Klingons. That's a fair enough point. Now, Kirk demands to know who put the triples in the grain and what was in the grain that killed them. Before that, though, or at the same time, the red shirts are leaving with the triples and Darwin comes in. And there's an interesting engagement. Yeah, the triple acts in the same way it did towards the Klingon in the, the, the bar before the fight. It does, and this intrigues Kirk, who wants to test things out. He holds the triple near various people. It turns out they like Vulcans and they like humans, but 
not Klingons. No, it starts squealing again in an agitated manner as soon as it gets close to, to Darwin. Spock says this must be a very perceptive race. McCoy enters at this point and is told to take a reading from Darwin and they discover that all is not as it seems. Heartbeat is all wrong. His body temperature is... Jim, this man is a Klingon. Klingon? I wonder what Starfleet Command will say about that. What about the grain, Bones? Oh, yes, it was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes, it's been impregnated with a virus. The virus turns into an inert material in the bloodstream. And the more the organism eats, the more inert matter is built up. So after two or three days, it would reach a point of where they couldn't take in enough nourishment to survive. They starve to death in a storage compartment full of grain. They starve to death. That is essentially it. Starvin, you don't talk. I have nothing to say. All right, I poisoned the grain. Take them away. And the tribbles had nothing to do with it. I don't know. I never saw one before in my life, and I hope I never see one of those fuzzy, miserable things again. I'm certain that can be arranged, Darwin. Guards? If you'll excuse me, Captain. Captain Koloff. About that apology? Yes. You have six hours to get your ship out of Federation territory. Yeah, Darwin collapsed under pressure from a triple there. Yeah, very unimpressive. I thought these Klingons were made of stronger stuff than this. He's obviously genuinely fearful of the creature. Why? Well, I guess we'll find out. Are we? Don't know. Okay. So with the Klingons gone, Kirk claims that he could get to like triples. He's grown into, you know, he's gone from being generally irritated to supremely smug. Mm -hmm. Because not only is he not responsible for any of the problems, his actions have actually saved the planet for the Federation. Very, very lucky. Ahura, very lucky. Yeah. Back down in the bar. Jones is expecting he is now free to go with everything having worked out. But Spock reminds him that the penalty for transporting animals dangerous to human life is 20 years of hard time. Rehabilitation. Mm, not rehabilitation, hard time. Okay. Breaking rocks. Jones tries to negotiate his way out of this as the Tribbles did indeed save the planet from the poisoned grain and tipped them off about the Klingon agent. So he is offered a deal. Yes, if he can remove every trouble from the station, he can have his ship back and leave. That sounds fair enough. However, this will take 17.9 years. Ah. <laughs> That's shorter than 20. Yeah. Kirk says to consider it job security, and he agrees. Yeah, well, he's no choice. No. Is that 17.9 years working continuously, or is he allowed to go to bed? Well, that's it, yeah. Mm. I mean, if it's working continuously, that's going to be, what, 50, 30, 50? 40, yeah, 50 years. Not such a good deal. Yeah, well, unless he's quite happy on the station, making a meagre living and... How will he make a, a living on the station? I suppose no. if he's, it doesn't if, need, if yeah. he's given room and board. Yeah, if he's given room and board, then he can probably sell things to people. Yeah. He probably have people bring stuff to him that you can sell on. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Back up in the bridge. Yes, Spock reports that a freighter with Quadro Triticale has been diverted and Sherman's planet will get its untainted supply just a few weeks late. And also, the Enterprise is now free of trouble. Yeah, I have some issues with this, but let's go through this process. Kirk has to ring it out of McCoy and Spock and Scotty, but he learns that Scotty beamed all the tribbles onto the Klingon ship. Yeah, just before they hit warp speed. They all laugh and then on to next adventure. So what's your issue with that? It's Hilarious and all, but did no one think of the welfare of the Tribbles? What are the Klingons going to do to them? Well, what do you think they instructed Jones to do? Well, this is it. Is, is all this, are they, are they being treated as pests? Are they being eradicated? I'd have thought they'd been fired out in space. Or put in a, a fire, a furnace somewhere. <sighs> that seems cruel. Now, what did you think when he said, right, to, to Jones, you've, you can stay here, but you need to get rid of them. What, well, I what was he going to do? They'd have, just don't feed them. They'll die off of natural causes within a few days each. Well, that's, you don't need uh, Jones to do that. Yeah. No, he's been told to get Well, them he's off. picking up the dead bodies because they've not been fed. So it's, it's not live troubles he's picking up. Yeah, okay. So here's the problem then. If that is the case, and you don't feed them and they die in a couple of days' time, it's not going to take 17 years to, you know, you can get through every room 
Well, they've already got 1.7 million of them. Mm, yeah, I think, I don't know. <laughs> not even that. If you go through every room and fire them out the window, it's not going to take seven, it's not going to take the best part of 20 years to, to clean up every room in the Enterprise. It's the space station he's cleaning them up, not the Sorry, sp- space, yeah, but that's, that's smaller than the Enterprise. Oh, it's going to be bigger. Is it? Yeah. But still, I don't think it takes you 20 years to go through every maybe, room. Maybe just trying to make him feel concerned. Yeah, maybe. Did you pick out Darwin before he was revealed as a spy? Um, to be fair with this episode, I wasn't really trying to work it out right. so much. So no, I didn't, but I wasn't paying that much attention to getting to the bottom of it. I was just, I was enjoying what was going on around me. I was pleased that they resisted the temptation to actually use Harry Mudd for the Sir No Jones role. It was nice to have someone slightly different. It was, but he wasn't as charismatic uh, as, as Mudd. No, different type of character. Well, quite a similar type of character to be fair. But not just as good. Not quite as okay. <laughs> what did you think of the the tribbles? You think they're a worthy adversary? Nah, don't like them. You didn't like the tribbles? I'm not a. They're I'm, wildly popular. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure they are, but I don't like pets. I'm not. A, you've got pet cats, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have a cat. They irritate me. I wouldn't miss. It's the type of thing you can stroke in a purring cat. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have that at all. If your wife came home with a tribble, would you be happy about it? No, I wouldn't be happy about it. For, for a start, say what is this? What you you what? It's not bad, did you? It's a tribble. Trouble, I say no. It it's very cute. It coos. Yeah, I don't care. Does it get batteries? No, no. It's it's it's, it's live out. Who do you think of keeping that? Mm, put it in the shed. Yeah. Then your shed's full with a thousand tribbles very soon. Yeah, it wouldn't be. I quite enjoyed Kirk having to come to terms with how banal his mission was and the fact he wasn't required to do anything life saving, or indeed heroic, in the course of the entire episode. Yeah, but you can't be. I mean, I'd have thought that'd be a, a welcome relief rather than you know be a, a countdown to almost certain death every week yeah but he's got a hero complex he gets uh, priority one calls like here i come i'm gonna save the d-. grain yeah seriously grain <laughs> and <laughs> grain and little furry cute creatures <laughs> furry little hamster yeah. things yeah any other thoughts on this one no like i said i can appreciate why people like it um it wouldn't be in my top 10 top 10 it wouldn't be your top 10 no, i would need to go back and look at it but i don't think so i mean there's other episodes i've enjoyed more okay that's one it's uh yeah i'll stand out for the triple you know if you if you mention the tribbles in six months time ago yeah i remember that episode but um yeah it was fine okay i wouldn't for me it's not a classic we'll see what ones you remember when we get to the end yeah oh I'll, I'll definitely remember it yeah okay it aired originally on the 29th of december just before new year 1967 yeah we all know what new year is yeah well different cultures etc Okay, well, it's not New Year for them then, is it? It was the 13th of the 14 episodes directed by Joseph Pevney. So we're almost done with him. Ah. We discussed him in more detail back on the podcast for Arena, as I've said 11 times before. David Gerald was the writer. We've briefly mentioned him before. This was officially the first of his two original series episodes, but he was involved in significant rewrites for iMud, and I think I touched on it then. He also wrote for The Twilight Zone, Babylon 5, Sliders, and many other things. Babylon Zoo. Did they write for them? Their hit single? Always wanted you to go into space, man. Yeah, there you go. He had an uncredited acting role in the first Star Trek movie, and he's now 77 years old. Good for him. William Campbell played Coloth in the second of his two appearances on the show, and he would later reprise the role in an episode of Deep Space Nine. He previously appeared as the eponymous Square of Gothos, as we mentioned during the episode, and you can hear more about him in the podcast for that one. William Shallert. Here's a guy who had a career, isn't he? He appeared as the officious Barris in his only appearance on the show, though he would later return in a different role on Deep Space Nine. He's perhaps best known for his role in Inner Space, but he also appeared on TV shows like ER, Roseanne. Sorry, Inner Space, the movie, Martin Short? Yeah. Okay. He also appeared on shows like ER, Roseanne and How I Met Your Mother and died in 2016 when he was 93. Can't complain. No. Stanley Adams played Cyrano Jones, a role he would later reprise in the animated series. An episode called More Tribbles, More Trouble. Mm. He also appeared in shows like Ironside and Mannix, as well as having a role in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Did he? Mm. He died from suicide in 1977 at the age of 62, reportedly following a spell of depression, which came after a serious back injury that limited his work. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Whit Bissell. He played Commander Lurie, the station commander. This was his only Star Trek role. He's perhaps best remembered for his role in I Was a Teenage Werewolf, where he was a mad scientist. But he also appeared in films like The Magnificent Seven and Creature from the Black Lagoon. 
as well as numerous, numerous TV shows over a prolific career. And he died in 1996 when he was 86. Charlie Brill played the Klingon spy Arna Darwin. This was his only Star Trek appearance, but he also showed up on series like Murder, She Wrote and Sledgehammer, oh. where he played a suspect and they shoot hammers, don't they? Good episode, yeah. He's now 83 years right. old. Do we have a Columbo connection this week? Michael Pataki, who played the Klingon Korax in his only role in the series. And he would later return as a different character in Star Trek The Next Generation. He also appeared in shows like Happy Days and TJ Hooker, and one of Jerry's favourite films, Halloween 4. Oh no. <laughs> I'm not actually a big fan of Halloween. The only Hall I've told you before, the, the yeah. Halloween 3 is the only one worth watching. Even the first one I can't be bothered with. You like Halloween 4? <laughs> no. Halloween oh. 3 all the way. He also appeared in an episode of, well, kind of appeared in an episode of Kind Columbo. of appeared. Tell me more. He's credited as playing Sam in the season two opener, Richard in Black. Don't recognise Sam. Cassavetes. Who is Sam? But unfortunately, all of his scenes ended up in the cutting room floor, so he's not seen in the episode, although he is still credited for it. And that's close enough oh, yeah. for me to make him this week's Columbo connection. No, that's, that's absolutely fine, yeah. He died in 2010 when he was 72. Bit of trivia. There you go. Took eight takes to get the scene with Kirk under the falling troubles done right they dropped all the troubles on him every time i can imagine this episode was the basis for a 30th anniversary this is one i want you to watch actually the next time you've got an hour free 30th anniversary special episode of deep space nine i think it's the sixth episode of season five if you want to go and find it on netflix where members of the deep space nine crew travel back in time and interact with the events of this episode ah okay i might do that then. very much worth a watch in that episode Worf, who's a klingon describes tribbles as the mortal enemies of the klingon empire it's believed that Klingons attacked and destroyed the Tribble homeworld somewhere between the end of the original series so, and the start of the next generation. Say, that can't be your nemesis, can't be all Tribbles. <laughs> that's, your, that's terrible. Okay. The Tribble noises were made from a combination of dove coos, screech owl hoots and air being released from balloons. When Spock says that Kirk heard what Barris had to say but could not believe his ears, that was a direct lift from a Mad Magazine spoof of Star Trek that had been published around about the time of filming. Oh, very good. Uh, we mentioned before the reference to Errand of Mercy where the Klingons mentioned the Organian Treaty. I think Chekhov also mentions it at the start of the episode. And in terms of international titles, the Italians go with Animaletti Pericolosi, which means dangerous little animals. And our friends in Japan take a different angle. Yeah, this could be good, okay. They go for Shinshu Kuwa Dotor Itikeru, which means new species of Quadro <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've missed the point here. They've gone for the green angle. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, and that's that's all the interesting translations. So next week, sixteenth episode of season two, the Gamesters of Triskelion. Which sounds relatively lighthearted. Yeah, it does. Until then, you can find us all over social media. Where we're at Trek Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you go to astartrekpodcast.com, dot a post up for every show where you can leave your thoughts your reminiscences and your complaints. Until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.